From the period of 1920 to 1923, we, we can begin to talk about national communists. Um, national communists were people who were distrustful of their colonizers, and they wanted to build socialism without the help of the Russians. Islam, uh, in their eyes, should be seen for, for its great cultural heritage, but the socialists wanted freedom of religion, but also a separation between church and state. In reality, it was increasingly clear that Turkestan was still a colony under the Bolsheviks. There were strong attacks on religion by the communists, forced secularization, the repression of religious elites, closing down courts, transferring uh, clergy functions to secular courts, including, for example, weddings. And so you had the uh, increased resistance. And in the 1920s, the Basmachis led this resistance. Religious leaders and believers attacked the Russians from the beginning, and Turkestan was basically in a state of civil war. Um, a dual civil war, if you consider the Red-White War, but it was in its own sort of civil war. And this became an all-out jihad following the 1918 Soviet massacre of Kokand. A sum in Fergana called the Basmachi a popular rising. Um, really, what happens, as the war raged, many commoners packed up and tried to get out, though. It wasn't necessarily incredibly popular. In general, um, most were highly supportive of the Basmachi, but they didn't want to get involved in it. Um, you didn't have a large proletariat that would oppose it. The mullahs were very strong and influential from Fergana to Bukhara. And the young Bukharans, with Soviet help, ultimately took Bukhara uh, when the emir fled. But they ruled it for only about four years until the Soviets were less busy with the Basmachis and could take firm control from them. So the Basmachis were sort of these rebel bands that ran around and 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 essentially promulgated a civil war within Central Asia itself. Now, the resistance ultimately paid off because they got concessions. In 1922, the Bolsheviks saw a need to change uh, their anti-religion line and, and their line on lots of other things. Um, this was the time of, time of the new economic program. Remember when Lenin had backtracked on communism, also known as war communism. So Lenin was less radical across the country. There was more private property, internal trade, private factories. In Central Asia, this meant a return of social institutions. Religious schools and courts took back some of the functions that they had lost in 1920, 1918, 1917, 1919. Mullahs were admitted into the Communist Party, and sometimes they even helped Communist Party policy, um, explaining to people why the com Communist cause was legitimate. Remember, going back to Stalin's nationalist policy, the whole idea was to use local structures, local norms, local institutions to push for communism. And so this, by, by becoming less radical and allowing the religious elites to, uh, to take a place within the system, the religious elites worked with them. But these were really short-lived reforms, and uh, soon religious courts were confined to just a few regions, and uh, many mullahs were again facing persecution. So very short-lived sort of uh, rise up again, these short-term concessions. So Bolsheviks came to power and they swiftly began to attack Islam. To understand the impact of these attacks, you first need to really understand how Islam, or religion in general, is transmitted. And there are three basic ways. Through elites, formally, we're talking about religious schools, uh, Friday prayers, uh, where the elites convey the, uh, the, the meaning of religion, um, there's social pressure to come in there, which leads us to the second aspect, which is community. Uh, but here we're talking more about holidays, which bring people together, thanks to the religious um, role, rites of passage, marriages, weddings, uh, <laughs> marriages and weddings, marriages, uh, births, uh, celebrations after a birth, 40 days after, for example, the, the, the understanding that the child will now live. Um, what else? There, well, there are the circumcisions in Muslim religion, funerals, obviously, all these sorts of rites of passage. And then finally, you've got family and religions passed on informally. It's passed on daily, you know, saying prayers, um, learning, learning parts of the Quran, whatever it might be. So if you want to attack religion, you have to get around these basically three lines of defense and the totalitarian system that the Soviet Union uh, relied upon up until 1956 was designed to overcome problems like this. It was especially effective at the elite level and at the community level, because what they were doing, as I mentioned in the previous day, was to, was to wipe out these horizontal ties. Uh, 
On the other hand, it was much less effective when it came to family. And it's important to remember in Central Asia, where clan or extended family networks are so strong, this meant that totalitarianism was significantly less effective here than in other parts of the Soviet Union, especially the European parts of the Soviet Union, where people would only trust those in their immediate family, most close to them. Since horizontal ties were always stronger in Central Asia, uh, they, they were somewhat weakened during totalitarianism, but not to the extent that you saw in uh, non-Central Asian parts of the Soviet Union, which gave uh, the religion stronger roots here. So, moving along from 1928 to 1938, when you've got the first phase of religious repression after this reprieve. So, I, I suppose you could talk about the first phase immediately after 1917. But at this point, we're talking about Stalin being in charge, and Stalin was ruthless when it came to religion. Stalin forced atheism on Central Asia and, and the rest of the Soviet Union. Here in Central Asia, he purged Muslim nationalist leaders from the local Communist Party. So religious leaders were purged. They were especially killed. Sometimes they were deported and sent to labor camps. Mosques, madrasas, uh, maktabs, all of these were closed. Their property was taken. The old structures were condemned as backwards. So this is sort of the elite religious level. At a more basic level, Stalin changed the alphabet to Latin and then to Cyrillic, which made the Arabic Quran less and less accessible over time and isolated Central Asians from their Muslim brethren abroad. They especially aimed uh, at the youth in the Communist Party and the Komsomol. So the Jadids and the young Bukharans were attacked for trying to reconcile some backwards institution, these religious institutions, with the new system. And they tried to indoctrinate people into... The Komsomol was sort of like a, sort of like our Girl Scout and Boy Scouts, but much more sinister. Well, I guess it depends on where you stand on some of the policies of the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. Well, it was much, it was much more sinister. Um, so, uh, so they used these instead of instead of the um, systems instead of the groups like the Jadids and the Young Bukharans who were trying to merge some elements of old and new. They used the Komsomol to just push the new, and of course the Communist Party and the youth wing within the Communist Party as well. They also created artificial boundaries. They demarcated uh, the territory of Central Asia, which we talked about in the last class. And this was supposed to split religious communities even more and prevent some sort of common unity to, an, to this anti-religion onslaught that was going on. Now, while elites adopted new territorial identities, I'm an Uzbek, I live in Uzbekistan, I'm a Kazakh, I live in Kazakhstan, etc., the masses were largely Muslim, especially in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. These, again, they settled these oasis areas. Uh, so... Resistance uh, was was stronger in this area. So now we go into a, the second phase, which is important. This is where Stalin makes a U-turn from 1941 to 1945 during World War II. And Stalin felt like he had to reverse course. He, at this point, began to take a utilitarian view of religion. He sought nationalism and unity in an effort to strengthen the war effort. Remember, he was getting pummeled by the Germans at this point. He didn't know he was going to war with the Germans because he had signed a secret pact the molotov ribbentrop uh, Pact, which was supposed to keep Russia and, and Germany um, out of war with each other, and they even split up part of Central Europe, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, but then the Germans in 1941 went off against uh, the Soviet Union. And so Stalin decided he needed to um, gain popular support. And Islam was legalized. You had a handful of mosques. There were a hundred large ones and much more, many more smaller ones. Um, they, that they stayed operating. They drew large crowds at Friday prayers, which showed how the efforts to wipe out religion had really failed. Even after the war, there was no real return to the pre-war anti-Islamic attacks, perhaps because religious institutions and the compromised clergy were actually a good way to keep an eye on the population. And by compromised clergy, I mean clergy who were official, quote-unquote official clergy, uh, who would often report to the KGB. So uh, religion became uh, useful. Uh, not for long, though. After Stalin died, ironically, Khrushchev, who was the most liberal, uh, well, he was certainly a liberal leader compared to Stalin. He actually condemned Stalin and fought the cult of personality and uh, had a thaw within the Soviet Union in general. Uh, he maintained some utilitarian aspects of Islam. Islam was used by the Communist Party to encourage ties with the Muslim world abroad uh, in the fight for the Third World. 
okay, that, that the U.S. and uh, the Soviet Union were engaged in, but he actually increased religious repression at home. That's the ironic part. Religious authorities were banned, taking part in religious ceremonies, uh, even in the few official mosques was, was actually dangerous. There were stories of people being fired from their jobs for attending their own parents' funerals, for example, religious funerals. Um, so all this did really is, is prompt the gradual growth of underground Islam. Really, again, because this, has happened, this had happened before World War II as well, this underground Islam. Uh, Khrushchev, as you recall, was, was pushed out of power, and Brezhnev was in power from the end of the 60s up until the early 1980s. And this was a period of laissez-faire. There was a relaxation on, on repression. Um, so it was laissez-faire with respect to political control, but also in how Brezhnev dealt with religion. There was basically a, 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 an agreement that anti-Islamic propaganda would be moderated in return for political conformity. If a person w worked well in their job, then religion was a matter of choice. It was a private issue. Nepotism and corruption, as you recall, were also okay. So there was little interference, which meant more permissiveness. So Islam was, was tolerated more and more. It was basically Islam, you can think of Islam and Brezhnev's treatment of Islam, just like how Brezhnev ran everything else. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, I'll leave you alone. Okay, so there was minimal interference. Now, under Gorbachev, you had economic reforms, you had less talk of integration, so you had a, a, a major change on the, on the political side and economic side. Um, during the conflict in the 1980s with Afghanistan, so, so the Soviet Union went to war in 1979 with Afghanistan. And this is interesting because obviously Afghanistan is a Muslim country. And so the, the Soviets thought the Central Asians um, could be helpful from this perspective. And in the 1980s, they realized that um, the Central Asians were not helpful at all because they were too sympathetic to the Afghans. And so they brought non-Muslims out of the war gradually. Um, lots of Central Asians fought in the war, but there was less of, an, of um, a dependence on Central Asians to go into Afghanistan than they initially anticipated. Gradually, religion became freer within Central Asia, although Islam was really the last major religion to enjoy this liberalization, which we'll talk about in the next class. Um, really because Islam was distrusted by communists till the end for all the reasons that I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture. Still, this opened the way for a rebound of traditions and festivals that, that were allowed in public view. And by this point, by the end of the 1980s, it was clear that religiosity wasn't just for the uneducated and downtrodden, but that everyone was in on it. Communist leaders in Central Asia, for example, pretended to be against religion in public, but then upon retirement, they would show their true colors and they would start coming to mosques um, in the open. Uh, so that was life under Gorbachev. Now, the bigger picture, when you look at the overall effects of religious policies, religiosity really varied by region. Um, in particular, in the southern parts of Central Asia, um, it, was, there was a, it was really a testament to the fact that nomadic groups uh, were less conservative and traditional. So the Kazakh and Kyrgyz uh, were more easily changed. They became much more easily, um, uh, more atheist or less, less religious than people in the south did. Uh, so religious worship, going to houses of prayer, largely disappeared, at least on its face, but people continued to practice Islamic customs that were far more embedded and difficult to stop. You had the rise, as I mentioned before, of these unofficial religious communities. And again, here I'm talking more about the settled areas um, than in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So uh, especially Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, parts of um, Kyrgyzstan, the Fergana area in particular, um, all around and also um, parts of Turkmenistan. Uh, so again, you have the rise of this unofficial, uh, unofficial religious communities um, very, they, they were in the underground. Um, and then there was also a small official clergy that was under the control of authorities that people tried to duck away from. Um, this could lead to contrasting interpretations of religion. For example, local informal religious leaders might demand that people fast on Ramadan, but the official clergy functioning in line with Moscow might say that you need your strength, so it's important to get your job done, and it's immoral to fast because you might miss work on religious, or it's also immoral to miss work on religious days. So a different, a different interpretation of Islam was going through society. Now throughout this period, 
Islam and identification with Islam became increasingly symbolic because of the process of secularizing that was going on. So some Muslim holidays, like Novruz, which were, that's, it's a Muslim holiday, it's a celebration of spring, it became really secularized. Uh, sort of, I, I guess a lot in the same way that you might think of uh, many people celebrating Christmas in the United States. Santa Claus. Santa Claus, how, you know, how, how much did Jesus have to do with Santa Claus? I'm not sure. Um, but I'm pretty sure I know. I don't believe. Oh, well, wow. All right, well, let me just go on. Um, so as you had this, this rise of symbolic religion, um, people had very limited knowledge of, of what religion was, of what religion really meant. So they had a few rituals, and they continued to practice these, but Islam became a type of identification mixed with Soviet customs. And I love this, this uh, picture right here, um, because... Uh, so this was by the lake that I used to live at. And, you know, basically what they're saying is <laughs> this happy vodka bottle is going to drown you, so watch out. Um, but the point here is that in Central Asia, alcohol is huge. Um, so you've got, you've got you know, large, large rates of alcohol consumption, polygamy, um, daily prayer is really just for old people. Very few younger people um, engage in daily prayer at all, um, not to mention five times a day. Um, the intermarriage um, is also fairly rare. Um, birth events, death, life events are, are still religious. Um, so there are some social aspects. Women are much more oriented towards family. Um, so there was what you find is there was a process of acculturation rather than assimilation. People adopted the Sovietization rather than simply accepted it. And the result is this skewed Islam. So uh, if you go to a circumcision or a wedding celebration, it's going to kick off at five in the morning with a big bowl of plov, this Central Asian dish. Um, and that's traditional, but there's also going to be massive vodka drinking going on there too, which isn't so traditional. So, you know, maybe I'll summarize on a different 